afternoon, everyone. I think we are getting everybody in from the waiting room. So we'll get started here. Um, I just want to thank you all for joining us again for the Superior Health Quality Alliance Roundtable Conversation. My name is Jerry Henniker, and I'm joined by my colleague, Kim Heft, as well as our guest speaker today, who is Kristen Bausch. Um, we host these one-hour sessions. They're the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. Um, the first half hour of the session or the first half of the session is a didactic presentation and then the remaining time is reserved for Q&A. One thing I'd ask you all to think about as you're um, participating in our session today is think about those pebbles in your shoes. What are those things that you're struggling about or struggling with, especially as we talk about um, dialysis in the nursing home today? What are those things that you struggle with um, and what can we help you with in that, in that scenario? Um, you can send a direct message to me in Zoom, or you can also put your suggestions in the space provided at the evaluation link, which we will share at the end of our session today. Um, we'll also be sharing the link to the PowerPoint presentation for today shortly, and that will also be in chat. Um, during our session today, you can use the chat to ask any questions or make any suggestions or share any experiences that you've had. Um, if you have any questions, of course, we'll get those to our speaker if we're not able to answer them before, and we can use them for the Q&A at the end of our session. And then before I forget, I wanted to let you know our next event is on June 14th, and we'll be discussing pneumococcal disease and vaccination. So with that, I'd like it to turn it over to our speaker for today, who is Kristen Bosch, as I said, and she'll be talking about managing nursing home residents receiving dialysis. Kristen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I am Kristen. I am a QIA with Superior Health Quality Alliance, as well as a Clinical Quality Improvement Manager with Wisconsin Hospital Association in the Madison, Wisconsin area, and a former home therapy dialysis nurse. And so I'm pleased to get to share some information with you today in managing nursing home residents receiving dialysis. So first up, um, we're gonna take a look at a couple polling questions. And more so in just that I want to ask on our first question, if you could respond in the chat, who has dialysis patients at your facility? You can answer yes, no, you're preparing to take in residents on dialysis, or maybe you're preparing to get your nursing home certified and trained to open up to dialysis patients. Well, it looks thus far like it looks like everyone is sending uh, their patients out for dialysis. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if somebody actually had dialysis in their home or maybe attached to the center or something, because I have heard that happening in some cases, but thus far, no. All right. And our second um, question there, and some of you may have already answered that, is what kind of dialysis are your patients participating in? In center hemodialysis? or are they having peritoneal dialysis? Is there anyone that has had any peritoneal dialysis patients with them? Okay, it looks like a majority of you are having the patients with hemodialysis, which is very common and sending them out to in-center. Um, very common, but also um, there are, um, you know, legislative things in, in place that they are looking to trend up on getting more patients involved in home therapy dialysis, which includes um, a lot larger population being seen in peritoneal dialysis. Um, and it's a little difficult to accommodate for the nursing home just because there's the extra training there, but we'll talk about that later. It's 
So some of the content that we will be covering is what is dialysis, some of the side effects that you may find in your patients, the nutritional education, specific medication management, fluid measurements, vaccinations, staff training to include PD catheters, access care and blood pressure checks, emergencies and special considerations. And our objectives today, when you walk away from here, I'm hoping that you are understanding what dialysis is with the two types, recognizing the important nutritional components of dialysis and how that is important for also your dietary staff, understanding importance of medication management, understanding the importance of fluid measurements and management, discuss the vaccinations important for dialysis patients, understanding the important staff training needed relating to peritoneal dialysis catheters, access site and cares and blood pressures, understanding the common side effects of dialysis, recognizing emergency situations to notify the dialysis centers and understanding some expectations for patients from the dialysis centers. So first, what is dialysis? Per the National Kidney F Foundation, dialysis is the type of treatment that helps your body remove extra fluid and waste products from your blood when the kidneys are not able to function correctly to do so. This is helping to keep your safe levels of potassium, sodium, calcium, and bicarbonates in the body, and helping to also regulate the blood pressure and the fluid control within the body as well. We have two types of dialysis, as we mentioned to begin with, hemodialysis, or you see there HD or HHD, which the HHD is home hemodialysis, and peritoneal dialysis, um, often referred to as PD. Hemodialysis occurs through a vascular access, so often the patient may have a central venous catheter, or a CVC, a fistula, or a graft. Uh, blood is removed through to a dial dialyzer to remove the waste and the extra fluid, which then cycles back through and returns to the blood into the body. It is done in center for about four hours, three times a week. Um, typically, patients might have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule or at home on HHD for about four to five times a week. And that's all dependent on uh, provider prescription. And this is a diagram kind of to give you a visual of what is happening in the body with um, hemodialysis. So the blood is uh, leaving the body at all points throughout the system. There are air checks in place um, so that typically what is used is called the next stage uh, dialyzer. Um, heparin may be used within the line um, depending on kind of the rate at which the patient is dialyzing. And if the patient just happens to be someone who clots easier, um, it's filtered through the dialyzer and then returned back to, um, to the body. So there's a series of systems in, um, in check that ensure that it's all done safely. Peritoneal dialysis, or PD, uh, this is done through a catheter access that is placed um, often in the uh, abdomen area. I have seen them um, sometimes having to be higher or lower, depending on the body habitus. Um, the, the dialysate is filled into the peritoneum. It dwells for a prescription of hours to allow for the filtration of the dialysate and draining to re and then drained to remove the extra fluid that has been pulled out and the waste products out of the blood vessels. This is completed daily or per the prescription orders and it's completed at home or again, as I had mentioned, in a certified nursing home where the staff from the dialysis center has trained uh, the appropriate nursing team. And a picture there, um, diagrams of peritoneal dialysis. Often there is a machine that's used. Um, this is a more simplistic version of the pictures that um, has just a manual bag that is done there. So the uh, you start with always emptying the peritoneum to make sure that anything that might be left over or may have been dwelling for a long uh, dwell time 
um, is drained out. And then it be there's a series of clamps that are exchanged on the lines. And then the dialysis is filled into the peritoneum. There's a prescription that they follow for how long it needs to dwell in the peritoneum. And then after that time is drained again, and then the series is completed um, um, by prescription for the number of times that need to be done. So next we will look at some common side effects uh, to look for in your residence there. Um, most common with hemodialysis include the muscle cramps afterwards, might see some hypotension, um, some weakness, dizziness, nausea. They might have some blood, blood loss at the uh, access site. Um, in peritoneal dialysis, you'll also find that some patients may have muscle cramps, especially in their legs. Uh, and they might have developed a hernia if they are um, perhaps already had a weakened area within, say, their uh, abdomen muscles, which is typically found prior to the placement of a peritoneal catheter. And uh, weight gain is another uh, concern to watch for. Um, and that's typically with not being able to drain properly. And we'll get into some of that later, which comes with some constipation and bowel management. And in both of them, you may see some skin, blood, or peritoneum infections, fatigue, which should improve with the duration of dialysis. The longer they're on it, the cleaner their blood is getting. And, um, you know, they're cleaning. Also, they ha will have clearer thoughts as well. And then puritis, the itching of the skin. Some nutritional education, and this is some great material to, you know, provide an in-service for dietary staff to help with managing this and updating the care team at the nursing home. Uh, the DASH diet helps to decrease blood pressure. We're looking for plant-based diet like whole grains, nuts, fruits, and vegetables, help keep the kidneys healthy. And we especially want to be managing the nutrients of phosphorus, potassium, protein, and sodium. So in the first example, you'll see here are some phos high phosphorus foods to limit or avoid and some low phosphorus alternatives to enjoy. Uh, typically when the patients are seen in center, uh, the care team, um, including a, a dietitian, will round on them at least uh, once a month, maybe even uh, more frequent than that, frequent, more frequent than that. Um, and they'll come up with a plan. They draw their labs in center. Um, they want to make sure that, you know, patients are strictly following this. So whenever you're sending someone to perhaps be a ride um, for them, you might want to see if there's any um, medical clinical notes that can be taken back with, or just staying in touch and open communication to gather that information that they may have communicated to the patient, but obviously would be more um, uh, controlled by the staff there at the nursing home. So this list will be available in the PowerPoint, as well as on the next slide, we have our potassium foods that are high and low. And on the next one, we'll talk more in depth about protein. Uh, once a Protein is used to build muscle and it's used for healing, fighting infection, and staying healthy. Once a person has started dialysis, a higher amount of protein in the diet is necessary to help maintain the blood protein levels and improve the health. Dialysis removes the protein waste from the blood, so a low protein diet is no longer needed. Animal sources of protein have all the essential amino acids, so the building blocks of the protein, and animal sources of protein vary in their amount of fat, with fatty cuts of red meat, whole milk, dairy products, and egg yolks being the highest in saturated fat, so less healthy for the heart, while fish, poultry, and low-fat or fat-free dairy products are lowest in saturated fat. You may need to eat smaller portions of meat and dairy. This will also help the patient and lowering the amount of phosphorus in the diet because the phosphorus is found in meat and dairy foods. Uh, plant sources of protein are low in one or more of the essential amino acids and plant sources of protein include beans, lentils, nuts, 
peanut butter, seeds, and whole grains. And a plant-based diet can meet their full uh, protein needs with careful planning and eating a variety of plant-based foods. Another bonus with plant, uh, plant proteins is that they are low in saturated fat and high in fiber, which comes in hand, especially with those peritoneal dialysis patients. Next, taking a look at sodium, most Americans have uh, too much sodium in their diet. Your kidney, when your kidneys are not healthy, the extra sodium and fluid build up in your body. And this can cause, cause the swollen ankles, puffiness, rise in blood pressure, shortness of breath, and fluid around the heart and lungs. So a healthy diet should include no more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. Some salt or sodium is needed for the body water balance, but when your kidneys lose the ability to control sodium and water balance, they can experience thirst, fluid gain, high blood pressure, discomfort during dialysis. And by using less sodium in the diet, you can control these problems. Um, some suggestions that we often give patients are to cook with herbs and spices instead of salt, um, making sure to read food labels. There's a lot, anything processed is uh, basically deemed as high in sodium. Um, and limiting if you need to limit potassium, avoid salt substitutes and limit the use of canned, processed, and frozen foods. So again, that list is there of acceptable substitutes and foods to limit. Next, we will get into the medication management portion. Um, some of what I felt were the most common that I know with physician and providers in which they may vary to look for and be able to manage appropriately, especially when it's not directly being managed by the patient themselves, are the following for phosphorus control. So often patients will be put on a phosphate binder, which is to be taken with meals and snacks. Sometimes patients can get confused with that and aren't certain um, when they're exactly supposed to be taking it. Also, we wanna pay close attention to any blood pressure medications to help control um, their blood pressures, as well as when they're given, um, specifically um, in accordance to when their dialysis treatments are scheduled and making those uh, be as consistent and timely as possible. Iron is another one that patients can typically run low in iron and being able to take supplements or they may get um, IV infused iron when they are in center. And bowel management with peritoneal dialysis patients, the big reason that patients may be putting on extra fluid is that they're not able to drain well um, the extra excess fluid out of the peritoneum. And everyone thinks that, um, yes, I, or they may say, no, I'm not constipated. And we talk about their bowel regimen more times than um, we don't and become very familiar with them that even if they are going just once a day, that that's still in the world of dialysis is considered um, constipated and we need them to be going several times throughout the day so that that fluid can drain out of the peritoneum. So we just want to make sure that the nursing home staff is consulting with the dialysis team on the appropriate times to be giving those medications um, that the doctor has prescribed as well. So not too soon after dialysis um, where they may already be coming out of in-center from hemodialysis and their blood pressures are already low. We don't want to bottom them out or just prior to treatment where now we're pulling that medication off of them because we're now cleaning out their blood. So we want to find just the right timing for that. Next into fluid measurements. So some, as we discussed with the blood pressure medications and salt intake that all plays a role into the fluid measurements in the body. And some individuals may be on fluid restriction. So again, that would be something to take into consideration and watch for, um, be in communication with the dialysis centers, make sure that it's being monitored strictly. I know it's a tough one to, um, especially when Patients are being told and residents being told that they can only drink so many, but it really truly has to be followed for their own safety. Um, can give gum for dry mouth. If the food, a, a common thing to consider as well is if there's a food that turns to liquid in just sitting out in um, room temperature, that that will be measured and counted as a fluid as well. Next into vaccinations. 
So there are some vaccines that are recommended specifically for dialysis and chronic kidney disease patients. Uh, the CDC recommended for dialysis and CKD patients um, is hepatitis B. We get annual testing and on a three-dose schedule. Uh, pneumococcal, we look for five-year and then follow up with a second dose and making sure that we're consulting with the doctor on this. And then our uh, COVID-19 bivalent, we want to have uh, the originating doses are along with the bivalent booster, making sure that these high-risk um, patients being on dialysis, their immune responses are going to be low already, that they're getting as many as the doses as possible so that they um, do not get sick and do not miss treatments. Um, they tend to get, can get very sick very sick very quickly um, if they do contact COVID. And then for all general uh, patients within your nursing home and the dialysis patients, we're also looking at the Tdap, influenza, and varicella. So some staff training, we'll talk about the peritoneal dialysis catheters, access care for fistula, graft, and CBC, and blood pressure checks. With PD catheters, cares are always performed by trained or certified staff at the clinic, unless staff has been trained by a dialysis clinic um, nursing staff and educator. We want to make sure that we ensure the catheter is secured onto the body, notify the clinic nurse with any signs of infection, which can include redness, tenderness, fevers, drainage, or leaking around the site or from the tube. Uh, these patients should not be in baths, hot tubs, or swimming pools, and it is not to get wet until healed. And next into access care, we have the fistulas, grafts, and CVCs. So cares are performed, again, by trained and certified staff at a clinic or center unless staff has trained the um, your staff has been trained by dialysis clinic staff. You always want to ensure that there's no bleeding from any of these access sites. Um, tape that might be left on when they come back to the nursing home should not be on for more than for 24 hours. And this is to prevent any occlusion or stenosis that would make it unable to be accessed the next time they go in, which then can end up with a trip to um, a procedural room of having to possibly get that um, removed and open back up again or finding another placement. Uh, the dressing on the CVC should be covered at all times and making sure that it does not get wet. And no blood pressures or lab draws should ever be taken on a fistula or a graft from um, within the nursing home. And that's to just ensure integrity of the site and that no infections occur as well because it is so detrimental to have access to it for the dialysis treatments themselves. So next we'll talk about blood pressure checks. So this is something that, you know, may seem very basic, but we wanna make sure that all staff are familiar with taking blood pressures correctly. So a good in-service to perform may be having a document that each person is going around to another nurse, CNA member, dietary staff, whoever it is, and practicing on each other and recording to see, have them sign off on a sheet. Did each person get a similar blood pressure um, to see that for to check for accuracy? Blood pressure checks should be taken at consistent times of the day and prior to medications being administered for the uh, dialysis patients and in accordance with their blood pressure medications. Sometimes they may have PRN medications that say hold when blood pressures are below a certain level. And we want to base that off of um, the parameters set by the uh, nephrologist and care team at the dialysis center. You want to make sure that you document the blood pressures and notify the dialysis clinic of any outside ranges, again, set by the nephrologist, and make sure that the blood pressure medications are administered timely. Some emergencies that you want to keep an eye for. So when should you contact the dialysis clinic or center? Um, this is the biggest concern that I think as a former dialysis nurse, and I've also worked in a nursing home um, as a nurse as well, 
that keeping the lines of communication is so imperative. Um, whenever a resident may be hospitalized, you want to make sure you reach out to that dialysis clinic or center immediately so that they can start getting things lined up for any treatments that may need to be performed in a hospital um, or when they may be returning to their chair spot because sometimes chair spots are hard to obtain the times and that also can cause some conflicts with scheduling um, with your staff as well and getting them to the clinic. Um, if the patient uh, or resident has any change in condition, so any fevers, signs or symptoms of infection, I know it's common thought to reach out to their primary. You also want to reach out uh, first and foremost to their, also to the dialysis center. If you have any changes to medications from outside providers, you know, often they're going to see their primary care providers on a consistent basis within the nursing home. Um, any changes that are done should be passed along to the dialysis center and they'll wanna make sure they, that they have you know, matching medical records for um, medications. If you have any extreme blood pressures on the highs or lows, any extreme weight gain, any excessive swelling or edema, and again, as discussed, uh, the constipation management in peritoneal dialysis patients as well. Some additional special considerations um, is just to make sure that you're always arriving early for all appointments with your residents to the clinic as they are often on a very tight schedule at getting all of the patients in at the um, assigned time for their dialysis treatments. Make sure that you have rides arranged for your residents. When residents are finished with um, hemodialysis treatments, you want to have someone walking with the ambulatory uh, residents to be sure that they don't take any falls and they may have some of that weakness or dizziness. And be sure that you're notifying your dialysis center as well if there's any uh, residents that you have that are considered fall risks and call the clinic or center if the resident is too sick to get out of bed. They can decline quickly with any mistreatments and they may need to reschedule for an open time or um, have to be seen um, either outpatient or admitted to a hospital for um, that additional treatment depending on what their current status is. And so next, we will open it up for questions. We don't have any questions in chat right now, Kristen. So um, for anybody, if you have any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask Kristen. Or um, if you want to put it in chat, too, we can take your questions that way. And I'm just, if it's OK for me to start out, I actually had a question um, while you were speaking speaking, um, Kristen, that I thought of, and um, it's more of a question if people want to put their answer in chat for those of you um, working in the um, nursing home facilities. When I was listening to the nutrition section, I was wondering how many facilities actually do have special diets available for their um, residents who are on dialysis, um, or is it up to the dialysis or is it up to the resident to know what they should and shouldn't eat? So that was a long question, but I'm just wondering, I'd like to, so wondering if we could hear from, you can put your answers in chat for those of you um, who wanna do that or if anybody wants to share, that's great too. And one of the things I did wanna to touch back on is often, um, you know, one of our leading causes of chronic kidney disease is diabetes. So um, often you're going to find that your patients that are diabetics or perhaps the ones also receiving dialysis and taking into account what those special diet considerations are as well. So if anybody can, so I am just curious if, if you're the places where everyone's working, um, if they have special diets available. Oh, and we do have a question too. Should facilities include the dialysis center in their care conference? That would be ideal. Um, often um, within the team of a dialysis center, they'll have their nephrologist, a social worker, a, a nutritionist or dietitian, as well as like a, a care managing nurse. So that would be great to have them included because I think you're going to get the best information um, 
once a, a resident is on dialysis, they're best seen as their primary care provider as being from the basis of that dialysis center. Yeah, you made a really good point, Kristen, because that is something that I highly encourage is that at least I, I, on a quarterly basis that there should be in-depth discussion about that dialysis patient, again, with the doctors, with the dialysis center, so on and so forth. That is something that we have practiced in the past. A care conference quarterly just for dialysis. Yes, and um, the dialysis centers are also required to keep care plans for the dialysis patients. So they are working on meeting goals that, you know, meeting benchmarks and making sure that everything is staying up to date. Also, um, you know, some of these patients, I mean, you can have varying ages at a nursing home. Um, so some of these patients, they might still be in consideration for a transplant. So um, some of the guidelines in those considerations are very strict. So having that open line of communication and knowing what's in the care plan is very important. Now, um, where I, a place I used to work, we had a, what you would call, I guess, a standardized uh, communication form uh, with the dialysis center for each patient. You know, we would send certain information to the dialysis center, and then they were required to give us a report back. Um, is that something that uh, you uh, recommend for each person? And I also wonder, does, does our audience, is that something you do also? Do you have a standardized form uh, or process when for communicating with your dialysis center? I do think that's a great consideration, um, especially if, um, you know, family isn't as involved in the care to report back um, what those um, needs are. It's a great way to keep those lines of communication open and make sure that, you know, that you're keeping your resident safe and healthy. Yeah, I see Krista um, put in chat that we're looking, we're working on implementing a new form right now. Um, you don't have to really uh, reinvent the wheel too much. Just so you know, if you look online and um, Google uh, hemodialysis uh, communication forms for nursing homes, there is a whole bunch of them. If you're, if you are interested in seeing what's out there and comparing and contrasting what you already do. And then you can implement that, put that right into your electronic health record and go from there. Uh, it also, uh, Stacy says our dietitian meets with our dialysis uh, residents regarding dietary needs and preferences. And I think, was that Stacy before? Hold on, I got to go up a little bit on my chat. Um, Yes, yeah, Stacy. in regards to uh, really trying to stay with liberized diets, but, uh, but dialysis patients may vary. I know it's a struggle and maybe that might have been something, Jerry, that you were experiencing with your dad is they know that their mate's supposed to eat this or not eat that, but I've already lived however long in my life and I'm eating what I want. I've heard that a lot too. So um, it, it is definitely a it, it does just vary from resident to resident, for sure. And it's um, <clears throat> it's interesting, I guess, would be the word I can use to hear uh, the patients come into the dialysis center and report what they're eating as to comparison of what their labs show. So the labs will never lie <laughs> as to whether they're sneaking in that, you know, extra little bit of something that they were told they were supposed to cut out a bit. Well, and I think too, and, and probably part of what I, what, when I was listening, Kristen is, I, I think it's a challenge for a lot of facilities um, because you're feeding a lot of people. And I think you had mentioned, you know, canned products and, and, you know, like canned vegetables and that, and it's kind of difficult to meet some of those requirements, but it sounds like too, from what we're hearing from our participants today is, you know, you can, 
you do the best you can. And, and I agree too, the residents have to realize what they can and can't need. So I think it's, you know, that combination of always making sure that at least there's something they can eat, right? Even if it's, you know, you can't feed everybody a dialysis diet, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so um, as long as there's options available, I think it's the best way to do it. Kristen, do you think there's anything in particular that, um, you know, nursing homes don't walk in the shoes of a dialysis center and vice versa, right? So um, being on the end, your end on the dialysis side, is there anything, well, first let me just talk about the resident. Is there anything in particular that you feel the nursing home should be supplying uh, that nursing home when they come to the dialysis center. I mean, for example, I hear that dialysis patients can get very cold when they receive dialysis. So, you know, is it important to make sure they got warm clothes, even hats or scarves or mittens or something? Or is that something dialysis centers will provide them, blankets and what have you? Some, some dialysis centers, when you are a new patient on dialysis, may have a welcome bag. I know the one I worked at did. So in the welcome bag, they provided a blanket, um, you know, some educational material as well. And so that's, and then like within a bag. And so that's something that they can bring back and forth when they come, you know, if they're sitting in a chair for four hours, they might want a book that they're, you know, reading, or maybe they have a tablet, iPad or something of that nature that they can um, perhaps be watching a, some form of media or reading or whatever it is. Um, and a lot of times the residents and patients in a dialysis center just enjoy that social time of interacting with others like them. Yeah, that's really, yeah, I'm really glad you pointed that out. I was actually just thinking, um, would you also recommend that if they have like approved um, pressure relieving mattresses for chairs, for example, to bring those with because of their sitting for four hours? So that's not something a dialysis center would just provide for them, correct? Right. They do have specialized chairs typically in the centers. Um, yeah, I again, I would consult with the team um, because again, just with safety features and things, they make sure that you know, in emergencies, they're in special chairs that quickly recline, you know, can be a hard base for if they, you know, CPR needs to perform, things like that. But, you know, the special considerations can be talked about in care conferences with the dialysis team. So is there anything, I'm curious, just for future presentation wise, is there anything that was a, a high, didn't take that into consideration or didn't know about dialysis um, for my patients? And on the flip of that, um, something that you could relate to like, oh yeah, we definitely see that a lot. Kristen, do you find that there's definitely more, well, here, I'm assuming this, um, but hemodialysis opposed to uh, peritoneal dialysis. Am I correct in saying that? And if I am, why is that? I'm not certain on what the exact numbers are. And again, I come from a I mean, home therapies background where yeah. the percentages are higher for peritoneal sure. dialysis. Um, but there are several, I mean, the numbers are quite significant for hemodialysis and that patients or residents that aren't able to facilitate the care themselves are going to, by default, be doing in-center hemodialysis. Um, again, I had mentioned at the beginning, there is a huge push, and I can't remember the exact year, I want to say like 2025, that uh, Trump had placed into legislation where a very high percentage. And I can't, again, it's um, been a while since I had read up on it, but I want to say like 
80s or higher that they want that many patients into home therapies. So it's a large amount and also patients and residents want the right to, um, you know, they, they might do better on in center because that's part of their social outing. You know, they get out and about, um, doing that. They don't have the resources or family or even nursing homes having the training capabilities to be doing, um, you know, home type therapies. Hmm. Very interesting. So there's also on the, on the, the federal side of everything, there is an actual F tag that is um, labeled dialysis. It's F698. And um, I was wondering if uh, those that are participating in today's event, um, you know, have you, have you ever had any issues um, with the surveyors in regards to dialysis? Um, any, uh, maybe a concern? I'm not saying you even got cited, but like a concern that, you know, they always give you your concerns. So, um, and if so, what was it on? It'd be interesting to know uh, so we can learn from each other on uh, what maybe their uh, surveyors are coming in and, and seeing and maybe particularly uh, pointing out to you. So please put it in chat, maybe just unmute yourself real quick and tell us if you've had any have anything happen in regards to a dialysis potential site. or maybe even just even related to dialysis, which went maybe covered a different um, potential site. So um, what do we have here? We have Krista, um, I've had an FYI on communication with the HD Center and care planning. Yeah, you know, I was wondering if someone was going to possibly bring something up some like this because I just have to hit home. The communication just really seems to be uh, big in regards to the overall all well-being for the dialysis uh, of resident is making sure that dialysis and nursing home are communicating and using things like standardized forms, um, doing a, maybe even having a transition care coordinator. I guess it would depend how many people you have that are on dialysis. Um, we had a big building at the time. There were like 10 people on dialysis. So we kind of had one person that kind of oversaw all 10 people because that was just enough to make sure we weren't missing the boat somewhere. So um, we talked about quarterly reviews and, uh, and make sure you have a policy on all of this, right? So that you know what to do. You do know what, what happens when that person goes to the hospital. Do you know that you should also call the the dialysis center, kind of like Kristen said, those special situations that need to be reported on. So Jana here indicates resident rights meals sent with resident for dialysis. Hmm. Yeah, food, snacks, you're right. I mean, it's not like you have a full blown out kitchen at the, uh, at the dialysis center for sure. Bag lunch, whole lunches versus a full meal that meets nutritional needs. Yeah, there's a lot to think about when it comes to the over, you know, the, the overall well being for that resident when they're at that dialysis center for four hours, maybe even more with the, the with, um, before and after, correct? You know, the actual process. So, I mean, what are they? They could be there for maybe four or five hours plus transportation and what, three times a week usually? Yeah, it's a lot out of a person. 
Because it's an it, Kristen, don't they need to eat, you know, like a certain amount within, you know, a certain time after dialysis? So the whole point of sending the meal with them. And so thank you, Jenna, for bringing that up. I'm wondering, yeah. is that something that other nursing homes are doing or are even aware of? I mean, maybe the dialysis center didn't tell you. Huh? And I, I would to, uh, you know, coordinate that as part of your care planning, because mm -hmm. often it may be, well, you're not allowed to have that in your chair, you know, like they, yeah. um, there may be restrictions of certain things within a clinic and especially with, you know, most recent years of infection prevention and different things, um, that, you know, masks are required at all times when they're in center. So great comments. Yes. Thank Another you. Another consideration too, is, um, that, have any patient in attendance, say with a history of hepatitis, is going to have a special chair time that, you know, might fall, they might have a special area that they can just come at any time and that's where they're sat, or it might be that they're, you know, scheduled more so towards the end of the clinic day. You know, that brings up a good question in regards to um, the COVID and the pandemic, yeah, I can't talk, the pandemic that, you know, we currently just ended here. And um, which doesn't mean that, you know, what, what are nursing homes, what are you doing when you have a outbreak, right? And it's not necessarily, do you send the person with appropriate, um, you know, PPE and do source control or, you know, what's the expectation on both ends? How do you see that, Kristen? From a from a dialysis clinic perspective, they often have a designated, especially if in, if you're in a larger area, like I'm in the Madison area. So there were specific clinics that they would have um, the dialysis patients report to. So you no longer came to your home clinic. You had to then get into, and it may be a different chair time and day schedule, whatever, um, to a specific clinic that they have um, different, um, you know, just the PPE and everything there is different and how they're bringing in the patients that may have been in contact with COVID, um, or are deemed safe enough to still then come into the clinic, but trying to prevent the risk of infection to other, um, of course, high risk individuals that are receiving dialysis. Oh, wow. So just another reason if you are experiencing an outbreak that you need to let your dialysis center know right away, because we're right. What if they can't take that patient and they have to go an hour away or something? Yes. You don't want to call them that day of <laughs> one hour before their appointment, by the way, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good thoughts. Another important thing too is um, any other procedures or dental work um, should be also notified to the dialysis center because um, often they might be put on um, uh, antibiotics ahead of time prophylactically as well. Any other questions? Any 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 comments, Kristen? Anything you'd like to, you know, uh, maybe close with, or any suggestions? Something you'd like the rest of the audience to know before we leave today? Um, I mean, I I'm hoping that um, yeah, that everyone had some great and possibly new information that was presented today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions by email listed there, but I think the key, key part is just, you know, keeping, and as some of you had mentioned, those open lines of communication with the dialysis center clinics and staff, um, because something that may seem, you know, 
just very norm to you or, oh, we only reach out to the primary is to um, keep them in the loop as well, because they kind of become the new primary provider and care team of that resident. We did just get a, um, a, a comment here in chat about facilities having a backup plan in case there's a breakout within a dialysis center. So now we got the reverse situation going the other way. So I guess the, um, would you say on your side, Kristen, that you would have maybe information for that home to, to go somewhere else? Generally, that would be arranged within the nursing care management that, you know, if they saw a trend, um, which myself, I can't, I, I, I'm i within an area that there were probably four clinics, like within um, closeness to each other. Um, and then an additional, you know, outside facility as well, a couple of them that were close um, and others that were maybe half an hour to an hour away. Um, I don't remember ever seeing or hearing of like outbreaks within a dialysis center. Um, I don't know what the present status of, but it was that everyone was getting screened when they came in and you had to wear a mask. Um, obviously with some of you know, states adopting the lifts on masking and things. I'm not sure if dialysis centers to date are still staying very stringent on that. Um, but it also may just be something, you know, worth mentioning to your residents to, you know, be a little more cautious with some of those things too, just to ensure if they are worried um, about an outbreak or, you know, contacting, contracting uh, COVID, you know, when they're in high risk is already, and then going into a dialysis center. Usually I, from what I've seen, those individuals coming in for a dialysis are some of the most cautious because they know that their health is of great risk. Well, Jerry, do you want to close? Wait, wait, do we have? Oh, no, we got to thank you. You're very welcome, Aikisha. Very welcome. Good question, by the way. Very good question. Jerry, any closing comments? Um, I, I did put the link to um, our evaluation in chat. Um, great discussion today, everybody. And I just, um, we'd love to hear your feedback, not only on today's session, but any suggestions that you have for future sessions. Also, if you think of any questions, again, relating to today's session or another topic, um, you can put those in the evaluation or you can even put them in chat or um, drop us an email too. Um, just again, a reminder, June 14th is our next session. Um, and we really appreciate having you all here and learning from each other. I, um, and thank you again, Kristen, for such a great presentation.